It's great to be with you this morning. Uh, I feel like uh, family here. Um, I know a lot of you already. Oops. But some of you I don't know, so I'll try and um, tell my story for you all to understand. But I've come here this morning just to say thank you, really, for the part that uh, this church has played um, in our mission in the Philippines over the years. I'm not sure how long I've known you, but it's quite a long time. And you've uh, supported me all that time through many pastors. Uh, and I'm re we're really grateful. And thank you to the worship team. I wasn't sure I'd be able to get up because I started crying during. <laughs> during uh, This is how I fight. I can't look at Michael because he cries as well. Uh, <laughs> and I can't look at Joy either. <laughs> This is, how I, this is how we fight our battles. That was uh, one of the favorite songs that our boys used to sing. Yeah. And as soon as you started playing it, I was um, almost at the place where I wouldn't be able to stand up and, and speak at all. Uh, worship is our life. Um, uh, worship, whenever we're in a hard place, we say to each other, we need to worship. Because we've uh, experienced the power of just worship and of prayer. Um, I mean, how many of you believe that God answers prayer? How many of you really believe that God answers your prayer? Yeah, and he really does. When you have your prayer meetings and you pray for Lama House and for Lama Ministries, God answers your prayers, and we're so grateful. Um, I was reading the other day from... Uh, 1 John chapter 3, and it's verse 21. Uh, when, when you get home, read 1 John chapter 3. Um, and it talks there about, it says, it, it addresses us as beloved. But that's the way God addresses us, beloved. Uh, if your heart, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commands and do what is pleasing in his sight. Um, and the, the uh, Amplified Version says, because we're, we are habitually seeking to follow his plan. And God answers our prayers. Um, and I want to give testimony to that this morning. Um, if, we're, if we're habitually seeking to follow his plan, uh, he will answer our prayers, and we will receive whatever we ask of him, because uh, as we were singing this morning, we're his children. I'm a child of God, and it's amazing, and we can't get our head around it, but we will receive what we ask of him when we're walking like that. So uh, um, I gave my life to Jesus when I was seven years old. Um, I was going to ask the children if anyone is seven, but they're not here, so I can't ask. But it's quite young, isn't it? And I understood fully um, what I was doing. My dad used to tell stories. Um, in Revelation, it says Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. And if you will open the door, he will come in. Uh, and he will uh, sup with you, it says. He'll spend, he'll, he'll do life with you. Uh, and so when I was seven, I knew uh, what I was doing. I was opening my, my life to Jesus. And dad used to say, when Jesus comes in, and, and he does come in immediately. You know, the door is closed when he knocks, but as soon as you open, he will come in. And, uh, and he'll come in and spend, and spend uh, you'll spend your life with him. Well, I knew that that's what I was doing, and I wanted to spend my life with Jesus. Um, and Dad used to say, you can't just uh, let him come into the lounge and not go into the kitchen and not go upstairs. You have to give him every, every part of your life. And I knew at age seven that I was doing that as well. And... Um, I also had a sense that I would be a missionary, uh, but I didn't know where and I didn't know what I would do because I was a very shy little girl, extremely shy. I never spoke to anybody. Um, if you'd asked me questions this morning, I wouldn't have answered any of them. <laughs> I would have said nothing. Uh, my report card at school said, Leslie needs to speak up in class, and I never spoke a word to any of my teachers. I was so shy. never spoke a word to anybody. Um, so when I was 13, um, it was during the charismatic movement in, in England, and there, there was talk about the Holy Spirit coming into your life 
and how he could give you boldness and confidence to witness to your friends. And I really wanted to uh, be able to do that at school because I was so shy and I wanted people to know about Jesus' love, but I was too shy to say anything. And so um, with my parents, we were seeking what's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Um, and at 13 years old, I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit in a Salvation Army Hall because God is no respecter of any denomination at all. And we were in an upper room in the Salvation Army Hall in Halifax. And I sat there until I received something because I didn't want, uh, again, to pretend. Uh, I wanted to experience God for myself. And it felt like um, a whole big, massive bucket full of love had been poured out on top of me and just drenched me. Um, I was drenched in love. And that was my experience. And it did transform my life. And around the same time, we were going to youth camps. Uh, we went to youth camp in Hollybush, uh, in Thirsk, in Yorkshire. My dad was the vicar of a church in Yorkshire at that time. And there was a choir there that came from the Philippine Islands. And they, they uh, would sing their songs uh, in their own language. Uh, they were dressed in Filipino costume. They had their hair piled up on top of their head. And as they sang, I was, I was probably about 10 or 11 years old, sitting near the front, and I just cried the whole time. Um, probably haven't stopped crying since. <laughs> it doesn't take much for me to cry, and Michael has inherited that. He hates it, but if I asked him to come up here and speak, he would stand here and cry. <laughs> um, and that's what's been happening all over England uh, as we've shared our story. Um, but I knew then that God wanted me to go to the Philippine Islands. Uh, and we traveled, we, we went and we listened to the choir sing in various locations. And every time I would sit there and just cry. Um, so I stayed in touch with that choir. I stayed in touch with the director who was Pastor Shields, a missionary from America. And uh, went through my nursing uh, training here in Gloucester. Uh, I love Gloucester. It's my city. I was here for four years in Gloucester, um, training to be a nurse. And when I finished my course, I wrote to Pastor Shields and said, can I come now and volunteer as a nurse at the Bible College and the children's home? And I'd been receiving their newsletters, and I'd been saving up my money and sending it back to the Philippine Islands. Even when I was a little child, I used to save up my pocket money until I had a pound note I could put in an envelope and send that to the Philippines. Um, and... Uh, God, God rewards that kind of giving. So for 40 years, I've, God has provided all my needs out there in the Philippines as a volunteer, which is amazing to think about. But uh, if you sow, you will reap. And I, I really thank God for people like you who've supported me all this time. Uh, and praise God for you. So yeah, um, Pastor Shield said to me, you need to um, do, I get some experience as a staff nurse before you come. I thought, well, yeah, actually I do. That's wise advice. Uh, and I wasn't ready at all. So I worked for a year in Gloucester on the I ward, which wasn't really the right experience to have, but I did what I was told. <laughs> and for a year, and then I thought, no, I want to go. But during that time, Pastor Shields died of a heart attack. And so I thought, well, I'll go anyway. So I went anyway, and one of the choir met me at the airport and uh, took me to Miracle Bible College in San Fernando, uh, where I worked as a, a volunteer nurse. I expected to have six other Filipino nurses working with me, but there was one, and she was leaving in two weeks' time. So I was thrown right in the deep end. Um, didn't know anything about hepatitis, typhoid, dengue fever, um, TB. Um, but all of those things I learned by experience over the years. <laughs> And uh, I depended on the local hospital. Uh, one of the hospitals was really rubbish, and the other one was very good. But when the money runs out in the Philippines, you can't pay for health care. And so I spent all the money that I'd saved, and I eventually ran out. And uh, it came down to, uh, do I believe that God answers prayer? Uh, do I believe... Um, when the Bible says, if you lay your hands on the sick, they will recover. Do I believe that God answers prayer? Um, 
and I had to trust him, trust God to do what he said. Uh, and I did lay hands on the sick, and many of them did recover. There's one a girl who had a very serious heart complaint. Her chest was enlarged because she had a, a, an enlarged heart, and she could hardly move. But we, we prayed over her. We, I used to um, stay awake at night and pray over her. Today, she is a pastor in the mountainous region of the Philippines, where she has to walk up and down the mountains to visit her congregation, um, and she's been completely healed. So God does answer prayer. Um, so I've been in the Philippines for 41 years this year. I went out for six months as a volunteer, um, and I stayed, <laughs> still volunteering. Um, but I can't tell you the whole story because it's too long. But this is my book. It's called Have a Little Faith. And there's two copies at the back. I haven't been able to bring many with me, but there's two for sale at the back if anybody hasn't read it yet. Um, so uh, fast forward um, to Lama House. And we're going to show a little video at the end so that you can see everything that I'm talking about this morning. But uh, I married Peter, who is a Filipino pastor. And we built Lama House, which is a home for residential care for street boys. Um, we had been fostering street boys since, since we got married. Uh, we got married and we went to Hong Kong to Jackie Pullinger's uh, um, Rehabilitation Center for, for Heroin Addicts. That's where we spent our honeymoon. <laughs> We're the only people who have done that, <laughs> but we loved it. Uh, and we came back from our honeymoon to a house full of street boys already. Uh, and the story for that is in my book, so get the book, um, how we came to start doing that. Um, and we had so many boys staying with us that our house was too small. And we asked God to give us a piece of land, which he did. Um, the money for the land was from people like you, just ordinary people in England giving 10 or 20 pounds a month, not huge amounts. We haven't got great, massive um, charities supporting us. Just people like you. Uh, what God can do with the little bit that you give is amazing. You know, it's like the loaves and fishes that the little boy gave. And it feeds so many for years to come. Um, so, uh, yeah, we built, we, we built Lama House. And it took us seven years to build because we wouldn't go into debt. Um, we, we said if God provides, we will build a little bit more. So we lived uh, in a building site when Michael was small. Um, I have two other children, Anna and Simon, and we lived there as it was being built around us. Um, it's a beautiful place. Um, we had around 20 boys at a time, age 9 to 19. Um, but those uh, ages expanded both ways. Um, the social services gave us guidelines, but uh, we didn't always stick to those guidelines. But we, I did my best <laughs> to do things uh, the way they wanted us to do. Um, we had to be licensed with them, we had to be accredited with them, and there's lots of piles and piles of paperwork. We had inspections, um, and for many years, that's what we did, for 35 years, we looked after teenage boys with the worst kind of problems with, uh, with broken hearts um, from a very young age. Um, and Jesus came, you know, when, when Jesus started his ministry, he stood up in church and he opened the scroll and he explained to the people why he came. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is on me and he has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. That was Jesus' purpose in coming. And that's all of us. All of us have had our hearts broken in some way. But we were ministering to little children who had had their hearts broken very badly uh, and who had suffered a lot of abuse um, and, or had been neglected. Some had even been abandoned. Some of them didn't even have a name when they came uh, to Lama House and we gave them a name. And we found, uh, we got them birth certificates if that's what was needed. Um, we found their families, if that's what was needed. We put them back where they, where they belonged. That wasn't always a good thing to do. And in that case, they stayed with us 
until they were ready to, to get work and to provide for themselves. So many of our boys today are now married. Uh, I call them our boys. They're not boys anymore, they're men. But they'll always be our boys. Um, they're married, they've got their own children. And usually at Christmas time, we all come together and have a, a grand reunion. So just before pandemic, we'd only got six boys left. Um, and we weren't getting referrals. Uh, lots of reasons for that. Um, but we sensed as well that God was bringing us into something new. Um, and we didn't know what that something new was. Uh, and of course, we didn't know that there was going to be a pandemic. So the pandemic hit us very hard and we were completely locked down. We weren't able to do anything. We had six boys uh, living with us at the time. We weren't able to let them go and find work. We weren't, they weren't allowed to go and do home visits to, to see their family. So for three years, we were, well, you know what it was like. We were stuck. And I was praying, Lord, because I knew that uh, he had something new for us, but I didn't know what that was. And I said, Lord, what do you want us to do? Um, I mean, I could have retired, I suppose. But uh, I didn't feel like that was what God wanted me to do. And nothing opened up um, for us to be able to do that anyway. Um, so God said to me through, uh, through things that I read and, and through different things that I heard, God said, uh, whatever you see God doing, do that. And I thought, well, what is God doing exactly? What is it that God is doing? And he did show me um, what he was doing. Every night before the boys went to bed, um, Michael, by this time, was doing devotions. We had, we had various staff over the years that, that helped us with this. But when Michael stepped into the role of doing devotions, something amazing happened. Um, we would be worshipping very much like we've just worshipped now. We sing these songs in the Philippines. You'd be amazed to know that in the grocery store in the Philippines, they, they sing, uh, they play Chris Tomlin, uh, Bless the Lord, O oh My Soul, and, and a lot of the songs that were written in England uh, are played publicly in the Philippines, and it's wonderful. Um, in the hospitals, in the grocery stores, in the banks, it's really wonderful to hear. Um, and we, we just love worship so much. But Michael would worship with the boys, and we'd gather around uh, in, a, in a circle. Um, the, these are not quiet, well-behaved boys. The, the, these are boys that it's very difficult for them to sit still uh, in class or in school. They didn't do very well in school. But when we worshipped, um, a calm would settle over them, um, a holy calm where the, it was unrushed. And some of them would have their hand on their heart. So some of them would uh, have their hands like this or or they would just be closed, close their eyes and their head would be bowed. And, and I just saw in, in my mind, I saw Jesus going around and just touching each one of them and, and healing their hearts and, and healing all of that damage that had been done to them. You know, we are called to, um, we are called to do something that only God can do. I can't heal a child that's been destroyed, you know. Uh, what can I do? Uh, what can anybody do? Be honest, even if I was a psychologist, I wouldn't be able to do it. Even if I was a social worker, I wouldn't be able to do it. But Jesus would go around in those times and I, I could almost see him touching them and healing them completely. Uh, or, or maybe not completely, but the process would be started in their life. And it was amazing, um, the atmosphere in Lama House. It uh, shouldn't have been what it was. When we, when we visited the government homes, it wasn't like that. The government homes were dark places, and the children were uh, despairing and completely hopeless. Um, but in Lama House, they were happy. And they were full of joy and full of life. Um, and God would answer their prayers. And these kids have never been in church. They weren't brought up in Christian families like I was. Nobody had prayed with them when they, before they slept. Nobody had given them a good night kiss. Nothing like that. Uh, and yet when they prayed, they would pray beautiful prayers, like somebody that had been in Bible college or something. 
I don't pray the way they prayed. And we would be in awe of what the Holy Spirit was doing. So that's what God was doing. And, and then Lama House closed. And God said, I want you to take what you've learned in Lama House, what you've seen me do, because it's God that does it, not us. I want, I want you to take that out. Uh, so that's what we've been doing. Um, and we got a call uh, just before pandemic from the social worker that used to come and monitor us. Uh, she had been promoted to RRCY as the center head. And RRCY is down the road about 30 minutes, is it, drive? Um, it's an open prison. Uh, it's, uh, there's barbed wire around it. There are armed guards that guard the, the boys there. And there were 160 boys in this place. They've committed crimes before they were the age of 18. And instead of going to adult prison, they went to RSCY. And we're thankful for RSCY because it, in many places around the Philippines, they go to adult prison. So you'll see children with the adults in prison. So all kinds of crimes, not just uh, stealing, not, not pickpocketing, uh, murder, rape, all kinds of crimes these boys have been accused of committing. There were 160 boys uh, in this place, and there were riots, uh, there were suicides. Uh, it was a dark place, and, and God said to us, uh, we want you there. And I used to go there in 1986 um, when it was much smaller. They were just starting out about the same time as Lama House started out, and uh, they, they said to me, um, you're not Catholic, so we don't want you to come anymore. It's a Catholic country. It's quite difficult to get into these places as, a, as, a, as not, a, not a priest. Um, so I was really sad about that. And I've prayed almost every day, I would say, that I would get another chance to go back. Because I imagine 160 boys in, in desperation in that place. Um, and Mylin said, would you come? So Michael um, started going into RSEY. And uh, I usually call him up now, but I won't. <laughs> uh, because he usually stands here and cries, bless him, uh, because he's witnessed what God has done in RCY. And honestly, we leave there every week with tears in our eyes. Uh, just witnessing what God has done in that place. It's been transformed. In transformation takes place from the inside out. Uh, and we went in there with Jesus and with worship with prayer, just the same as what we had in Lama House, very simple, just one hour we were, give, we were given, and Michael got a team together, and they went in and worshipped. And one of the first meetings that he had, it, it's intimidating, you know, they've all got tattoos, they're tough boys, uh, their faces are tattooed, um, not just their body, but their faces are tattooed, and they're just young boys. Um, some of them shouldn't be there. The, the one or two, perhaps, that had been in church before. And Michael felt he should give an altar call. And he'd never done an altar call before, but he'd seen me and his dad do it. Uh, and so he said, if anybody here would like to accept Jesus into their life, just put up your hand. And he expected perhaps two of them, the, the sort of uh, ones that have been in church before, they might put their hands up. You know, all of them, over 100 boys, put their ha shot their hands up in the air with enthusiasm and shouted, we do. And that was the start of God sweeping through that place. And it's gone down now from 160 to less than 60. When we um, did the video, it was 60 boys that were there. And it, every day we get messages from different ones that are saying we're out. <laughs> uh, we're in church. <laughs> we found a church. The other day we got a message from one of them and they were at a concert, um, a Christian concert, praising the Lord. Uh, God has done wonderful things in that place. And after each session, uh, we invite them to come forward. And if anyone wants prayer, just come forward. We'll pray with you at the end. And we've seen miracles of healing as, as they, they come forward and they huddle together and pray. They know that God answers prayer. They know that they're a child of God and that he answers their prayer, that he will hear them, and that they will receive what they ask for. Uh, one boy was healed of glaucoma. One boy was healed of a, a damaged heart. Uh, all confirmed by doctor's appointments. 
uh, and they know that God answers prayer. And so we gather and they say, please pray for our court hearing. Please pray that we can go home. Please pray for our families. Um, and they're all in a different place, of course. Um, but they know that God answers prayer. And the security guards come to Michael afterwards and say, can we have the notes from your sermon? Um, <laughs> can you pray for us? The house parents, have, we've given them Christian books that they can use in their sessions with the boys. And usually when the, when the different groups come in and do sessions with the boys, they have like five or six boys that were interested and that will come. They're not forced to come, but all of them come to our sessions. And when we arrive there, they've got all the chairs laid out already like this, and they're all sitting there waiting for us to arrive. Sometimes we're late, stuck in traffic or something. They'll all be sitting there quietly waiting for us to come. They're not fooling around. And it's just amazing what God has done. And you'll see some pictures of it in the, in the video. So our vision now is to take what God has done in, in Lama House out. And we want to go. There's a girl's home that we would like to get into. Uh, we haven't been able to do that yet. Uh, perhaps you can pray that we would be able to get in. They're victims of uh, rape. Um, and there's, there's too many girls in the home, and it's a dark place. Um, and we want to go there and do this and see the same thing happen there. Um, so Mylin, the social worker, has just been promoted again, so she, and she's received award after award for what's happening there. And she says, it's God, it's not me. And she knows God has promoted her. She knows God has transformed the place. And it's a real good testimony. This is what your prayer does when you receive my newsletter and you, you start to pray. And I know some of you have prayed for different situations. Uh, God answers prayer. And he might not always answer in the way that we expect him to. But he listens. We're his children. And, and he will answer. So uh, I'd like to show you the video. Uh, I won't talk anymore because I'm going on too long again. Uh, we'll show you the video. And I, I know God will speak to you as you watch. the Philippines in 1983 as a volunteer nurse and uh, I stayed until now so I've been here for 40 years and its objectives are to share God, God's love and to share the good news and the teachings of Jesus Christ and to relieve poverty in the Philippine Islands. Um, I married Peter Gomez and together we established Lama House as a residential care facility for boys who have been abandoned, neglected or abused. Um, we built Lama House in 1991 uh, until 1997 um, from donations from the churches in England. And we opened to provide 20 places for, for boys who were referred from the Department of Social Welfare and Development, or the DSWD, here in the Philippines. Um, we have to license and accredit with the DSWD, and we were accredited until 2021, when after the pandemic, we closed as a residential facility. So today, Lama House is a place of worship, um, continuing the wider vision of reaching young people for Christ. services to the government-run children's homes and at the moment we go into the detention center in Boang where there are 60 boys who are detained for various crimes and uh, we bring the good news of Jesus to them and it's wonderful what God is doing in that place. And we 
we have monthly worship concerts here in Lama House and various events for the young people. And our vision is to take worship out of the church and into businesses and cafes in the city. in the Bible in John chapter 10 verse 10 which says the thief comes only to steal to kill and destroy I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly so life and more abundant ministries is the name of our charity So uh, we don't just want to give information about Jesus. We don't, we don't want to we don't want to tell them sort of who Jesus was and and what Jesus did and just give information. What we want is for them to encounter Jesus. Um, but when they encounter Jesus, that's what that's what the difference is. Uh, and we found that uh, that happens during worship, as we worship. Uh, when you set the atmosphere on God, 
when God can come and God can do anything. Uh, so in your life, um, in your work, in your school, wherever you are, set the atmosphere on God, worship, and, and just watch what God will do uh, with your worship. That's all. That's all it is. Um, we don't have any programs or anything um, detailed like that. We worship and we pray. Uh, and as we seek God and as, as we invite him, come Holy Spirit, uh, that's when things can happen and prayers can be answered. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much uh, for everything that you do. <laughs>